Happy spring break. Daylight savings time. It's, it's weird to look out there and see daylight this time of night. So it's great to be with you. Again, I, I didn't realize there'd be this many people here. It's fun. Uh, spring break. I guess you're like me. We don't get to take spring break. So, um, you know, tonight uh, we're going to be studying probably one of the most, maybe the most controversial doctrine that, um, that Christians talk about. And uh, it is not easy, and uh, I would think that a lot of you have probably studied the doctrine of election. How many of you have studied the doctrine of election? Okay. How many of you know about the doctrine of election? Well, um, it's a great truth, and it is a vast subject, and we've only got an hour to go over it. So uh, I'm going to attempt to to make a dent in it, and I hope that the Lord uh, will use His Word to um, enable you to see him in a greater way and what he's done for you and your salvation. Uh, I mentioned this last week. I have studied the doctrines of grace um, nearly my entire Christian life, which has been almost 50 years. And um, I studied this week, and I continue to learn more and, and appreciate what God has done uh, in this fantastic doctrine, the doctrine of election, um, which I call distinguishing grace. So we're going to we're going to be. The title is really God's electing and distinguishing grace. That's what we're going to look at tonight. And I've got two chap uh, two chapters or two sections in in one in Romans and one in Genesis. I'd like for you to take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter nine. And we're going to be looking at, we're going to read first there, verses 9 through 14. And once we read that, we'll turn over to Genesis uh, 25. So this is God's distinguishing and electing grace in salvation. Paul writes, uh, starting in verse 6, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all of Israel, who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Verse 12, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved but Esau I hated. And finally, verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Now, when Paul writes this, uh, it, it, it's amazing because he um, knew his Bible, and he was thinking about the Old Testament Scripture, and he was thinking about in Genesis. So I want you to turn to Genesis chapter uh, 25, and we're going to read verses 21 through 26. And, and here it is. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. Now, now it's interesting here, he's 40 years old, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? And so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, There's two nations in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. And one peoples shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger." And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. 
And now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. And afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau, Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. Now you'll notice that it could have been 20 years that Isaac prayed for her. She was barren. And yet the promise had been directly from God that the seed would come through him. So that's an amazing thing when we think about that. Now, last week, I opened up with an illustration. No, two weeks ago. So I brought back the illustration. How many of you were not here and saw last week's illustration? Didn't see it two weeks ago. Everybody seen it? Nobody's seen it? All right, here we go. We got a few. All right, so... <laughs> So let me, let me explain. This is so important because as we, do, as we follow up the doctrines of grace, we need to understand what we're dealing with. And last week, do you remember we dealt with total depravity? And here's what, what we did. We took, there's been a lot of misunderstandings. We took this clear bottle and we said this was really um, before the fall. This was, this was before sin. And we read Genesis 1.31 at the very beginning of the Bible after God had created everything, he said, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So this was man. This was us. Everything good before sin entered the race. And then I, I think I told you, I did this actually again. Where is it? I actually went to a job site, and I got this bottle of lacquer and, and stain, and I, I put this in here, and this obviously represents sin and, uh, and what we... Woo, man. So anyway, so what we did last week, and I want to do it again this week because this is so important, is that we poured a little bottle, just a little bit of this in here, and, and you can see that it just turned, it turned, let me see here, I turned, there you go, okay, so we'll shake it up. All right, now here's the point, here's the point. When people hear the doctrine of, of total depravity, they think, right, that we are as bad as we could be, totally bad. And that's not what it teaches. It teaches that we are, are completely contaminated. I could pour more sin in this bottle, right? I could pour less in this bottle. But the point is, once a little sin is in this bottle, it's completely contaminated, Nobody is going to drink this. Matter of fact, you're hardly even going to smell it because it is completely contaminated. And so it's not the amount of sin, right? It is that sin infected the human race fundamentally and comprehensively, completely evil. And we jumped ahead in Genesis 6, 5, and, and here's what the Lord said that he saw this time. He saw after creation, everything was good, and now after the fall, it says in Genesis 6, 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was continually evil. And so here's the big deal. The consequences of sin for the human race is far greater than any of us can ever imagine. It's just unimaginable what sin has done to the human race. And so what I want you to do now is I want you to look up these verses with me. And these are just a few of the verses that talk about the effects of sin. So I want, I want to get our minds in line of where we are right now, because that's what we're dealing with, the sin and God and the fall. Romans 3, turn to Romans 3, we're going to look at verses 10 and 12. Paul writes, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. Now that 
Ladies, is the effect of sin. It has completely contaminated us where there's, no, nothing we, there, there's nothing we can do that's good in God's eyes. We're separated from Him. Romans 3.23, just down the page. For all, not some, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Effect of sin. Now turn over Romans chapter 6, 23. Verse 23, you know these verses. But again, just to set our mind where we're going, for the wages of sin, the fall of Adam is what? Death. It's death. And then if you'll uh, flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Got you working in your Bibles tonight. You probably know this. And here it is, sin's consequences. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So there's just death, 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 all, all, all. Okay? Now, Psalm 143, 2. Psalm 143, 2. Here it is. For in your sight, this is the way God looks at the whole human race, no man living is righteous. So the effects of sin were catastrophic. And, and I think still we will not know until we get to heaven how much damage sin has done to the human race and the amount of grace and mercy God has shown us to forgive us of that sin. It's absolutely astonishing. So in short, sin's most devastating outcome is that it what? It has separated us from our Creator. We were created initially to have a relationship with Him. And sin separated us. It, it, it divided us. It, we had this wonderful relationship, and then sin came, and we have complete separation from him. Isaiah 59, 2. Let me, let me just read it. You don't have to turn to it. He says, but your wrongdoings have caused a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he doesn't hear. Why is that? Why is there this incredible separation and divide between us and our Creator? Well, very simply, He's holy. He is holy. He's blameless. He's faultless. He has complete moral purity. He's without sin. And as you know, Isaiah refers to Him as holy, 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 three times in chapter 6, to emphasize that he is extremely, extremely, extremely holy, separated from sin. He can't look on sin. Sin always separates. You know, if you have issues in a relationship, if you have issues with a friend, if there's sin involved, it causes separation. Sin, ladies, always separates, number one, from our Creator. We're separated. You remember uh, the rich man in Lazarus in Luke 16. The rich man dies, finds himself in hell, and he makes mention of this great chasm. Do you remember that? This great chasm that's fixed that no one can cross. And get to the other side. And that chasm is what sin does. It divides us and God. And so what I want us to see then is that the sin that is in our lives, all of our lives, separates us from God. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to, I'm going to take this way over here and I'm going to sit it back here like this. Just so you can see and be reminded, there is a vast chasm with every one of us that are born into this world because we're all sinners. 
without Christ. Now, what that means is, is that God must punish sin. I know this is elementary, but I, I want you to get this again. He is not only holy, but He is just. John 8, we mention this all the time. Sinners, sinners. He's talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, your father is the devil. You're a sinner. So where does that leave the sinner? Where does that leave you? Where does that leave me as a sinner? It leaves us facing the holy, just wrath of God. That, that's why we have church. That's why Steve Lawson has given his life. He could have done so many other things. That's why we make all this effort to do everything we do because sinners are facing the holy wrath of God. We are all doomed for God's judgment. Left in our sin, listen, ladies, we are facing everlasting punishment. And that is being tormented and suffering in a lake of fire that burns but will never burn you up. It's in outer darkness. It's separated from God and from everyone all alone where there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. That's where it leaves us forever. And that is why the whole world revolves around the Son of God who came to this earth 2,000 years ago because of the impending doom that no one can imagine how horrible it is, the lake of fire, forever punishment because of our sin. And you know what? God would be perfectly just to leave us in our sin. He's holy. We sinned. He could have left us in our sin and punished us all forever. He could have sent us all to hell because that's what we deserve. Our rebellion is totally deserving of hell. One sin, one sin contaminates the whole thing. And it separates us from God. But God, listen, God who is rich in mercy has determined in His infinite wisdom to choose some, elect some with His distinguishing grace for salvation. Praise God. That's what gives us hope. And that's our, that's our message tonight. That's our sermon tonight. God's electing, distinguishing love to some for salvation that we don't deserve. And it isn't easy. It, this is just not an easy doctrine to understand. And you know why it's not easy? You know why there's so much um, anger and consternation and, and just hard to get our brains around it? Because at the very center, at the very center of our being, because of sin, we believe we have something good in us that can make God accept us. That's what we believe. It may be just a little bit, but we believe there's something in us, just a little bit. Not much, but just enough to make it work for God. And that, ladies, is why so many people get upset over this. But distinguishing grace, you know what, is all throughout the Bible. God's electing grace is on every page of the Bible. And, and I, could, I could take the rest of the hour, hour just mentioning it, but, but for number one, think about it. Abel over Cain. Moses. Noah. Abraham. Isaac. Jacob. The nation of Israel, all elected and chosen and distinguished and separated. King David, Jonah, the prophets, the disciples, the apostle Paul, everyone elected and distinguished 
and pulled out. It's all throughout the Bible. And, and we just miss it. We don't see it because we don't want to see it. In fact, how many of you were here this past Sunday and heard um, Steve's message? I need to see hands. Now, I want you, everybody to hold their hand that wasn't here and tell me what you were doing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so I want you to look back at the message. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 4, and I want you to look at verses 25 and 26 with me. So here's what he says, starting in verse 25. But I say to you, in truth, there were many widows. Now, now he makes a point to say there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the skies were shut up for three years and six months when a great famine came over the land, verse 26. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. So Luke makes the point, there were many, and yet Elijah goes to one, one that's distinguished, just one. Okay, look at the next verse, Luke 4, 27, and there were many lepers, many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but look, but only one, only one, Naaman, the Syrian. And so Jesus makes the point. There are many lepers. There are many widows. Well, Elijah and Elisha were only sent to one. And you know how the people responded? Do you remember why they responded? Because they weren't part of it? Look, look what it says. Verse 28. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage because they didn't like it. They didn't like distinguishing grace. They didn't like it that they, Jesus didn't, didn't come to them and heal them and their friends, and, and they did not like it. And so here's what I want you to understand. At the very beginning, it is natural to have an anger at first when we come to learn that there is... Not only, there's nothing we can do, absolutely nothing, listen ladies, that's good in us. There, there's, there's nothing, nothing, nothing good in us, zero. If there's ever going to be anything good in us, it has to be all of God. It has to be all of God. It, it's none of us. And so there's distinguishing grace. God, God's economy has distinguishing grace all the way through it. We just don't pick it up. So broadly speaking, election and distinguishing grace means, here it is, that God chooses, He elects to do everything in whatever manner He deems appropriate in salvation. And when He acts... And when he chooses, and when he distinguishes, he does so in his own bullish, volition, independence, and outside of any influence. That's God's distinguishing grace. Now let me read to you the um, Westminster Confession of Faith, just a, a few sentences here. This is the definition of God's distinguishing, electing grace. Those of mankind that are predestined to life, God, before the foundation of the world, was laid according to His eternal and immutable purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of His will has chosen in Christ to everlasting glory out of His free grace and love alone without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance in either of them or any other thing in the creature 
as conditions or causes moving him for that purpose and all to the praise of his glorious grace. And so Paul writes in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, I'll read this to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, this is the Apostle Paul, and here's what he says. Just as he chose us in him when, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. So that is God's electing, distinguishing grace. And it's all through the Bible. Now let's go on. If you're in Christ, if you're here and you know Christ, it is because God chose you before the foundation of the earth to bring you to faith. I said this before. He didn't force you. He made you willing. He jiggled your willer so that you would come. He gave you faith. It all begins and ends with Him. Now, I want you to write these three, these three things down, and I want you to write them maybe on the top right-hand side of your, of your page because every time you stop and think about election or distinguishing grace, I want you to remember these three things. Just sear it in your mind. Number one, understanding this great doctrine will cause you to have a greater appreciation of God's grace, to understand really what God's grace did, that you're over there separated from sin, dead, unable to do anything. And God, in His grace and mercy, plucked you out of hell. So number one, when you think of this doctrine, it's got to give us a greater appreciation for grace. Number two, it should smash your pride, crush your pride, cause you to be more humble and me to be more humble. Because when I look at myself and recognize what the Bible says, that I am dead in my sin, separated from God with this great chasm, and for nothing in and of myself, I find myself trusting in Jesus. I did nothing. I responded because he first loved me. And so where is my pride? It should cause humility. Number three, it should cause us to love God more and give Him more glory. Because if it weren't for His electing, loving grace, ladies, you'd be in some bar somewhere. You'd be in a ditch. You'd be in a homeless shelter. You would not be here excited and interested in the things of God. And it's not because you were smarter. It's not because you had something on somebody else. It's not because you had more brain power or a bigger heart or you just caught up and and figured it out and the other person didn't. It is because of God. That's the only reason. So I want us to look at Romans 6. I want to make four points real quick. Romans 6, 9, uh, uh, sorry, Romans 9, verses 6 through 14. Okay, Romans 9, verses 6 through 14. And we're going, to do, we're going to look at it this way. We're going, to, we're going to walk through it this way. Number one, God's choice is guaranteed in 6A. God's choice is guaranteed. 6B through 7A, God's choice is explained. Probably need to put it up here on the board. Somebody said I was going too fast, Amy. So God's choice is guaranteed. God's choice is explained. Then verses 7b through 13, God's choice is illustrated. 
And then number four, God's choice is questioned in verse 14. Okay, so here it is. God's choice is guaranteed, verse 6a. God's choice is explained, verse 6b through 7a. God's choice is illustrated, verse 7b through 13. And God's choice is questioned, verse 14. All right, so here we go. Paul writes, verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. And what does he mean by that? Paul, Paul, here's the background. Paul has a concern for the salvation of his Jewish people. Uh, he, he, he was a Jew himself, and God saved him, and he knew the promises that, that God had given to the nation of Israel. He knew the Jews were the chosen one. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But now we read that he is concerned that not all of Israel has embraced Jesus as Savior. And in fact, as, as Paul has continued to grow and mature in his Christian faith, he's seen more Gentiles accept Christ than Jews. And so he's asking himself the question, Lord, I thought you said <laughs> that all the Jews were going to be saved. I, I thought you said, what's, what's going on? Has, has your word failed? And, and if we're in Paul's shoes, we're thinking the same thing. I, I love my people, he's thinking, just like you love your family. And, and they seem to reject your word. They, they don't have any interest in it for the most part. Did God's choice of Israel fail? Imagine his concern. Paul's wondering, I, I, I'm, am, I, am I confused? Now, here, here's something, side note. Anytime you have confusion, go to the Word of God. Study your Bible. And what did Paul do? He went to the Word of God, and he looked it up, and he studied it. And this is, this is the result of what he studied. Um. Paul knows back in Genesis 17 that God had promised to make Abraham a great nation, to make him exceedingly fruitful, to establish the promise, and not only him, but all his descendants forever. He knew that. But Paul sees this natural seed of Abraham. Listen, the natural seed is rejecting the promise. So even though Paul feels in some ways that God... His word has failed. He, he recognizes, look what he says, it hasn't failed. He's, he's discovered it hasn't failed. And he says, it is not. Do you see that? It is not as though the word has failed. It hasn't failed. And so we, we look around in our lives, we wonder, is God's word failing like Paul sometimes? Are people just not getting it? Why aren't they interested? Why aren't they listening? Why are they ignoring and the answer is no. God's Word never returns void. It never falls to the ground dead and dies. We had the evangelists over last night, and after they went out to, to evangelize, and I was so encouraged thinking all of the people they met with and talked to, to hear those, that God's Word never returns void. It never dies. It never just gets thrown over in the corner and 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 doesn't work, or thrown in the trash, it always operates and always returns something. And that's what Paul comes to understand. God's sovereign hand is still active in ways beyond our understanding. And so God's choice is guaranteed. That's what he found out. Now let's look at this. God's choice is explained. Verse 6b. For they are not all Israel who descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. So again, Paul goes back to the Old Testament. He goes to Genesis 25, and he's thinking about the promises, and he's thinking about how God said they're going to continue through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then it's like it becomes clear as a bell to him. And here's what he comes to understand. 
that not all of the natural descendants, not all of the offspring of Abraham, not everyone in his bloodline will belong to God's Israel. You see that? Not all of Israel is true Israel. There is a remnant that will follow God because of his electing, distinguishing choice by grace. And here's the point. It is only those who walk in the steps of Abraham as he walked in faith. God's people will only be those who are not just circumcised in the flesh, but Paul learns circumcised in their heart. Because salvation is a heart issue. So there's no failure with God ever. The failure's on Israel for not believing and trusting in Christ. Sinclair Ferguson explains this. He says, it's one thing to be circumcised, that is to belong to the nation of Israel, and it's another thing to experience the circumcision of the heart that God has promised to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you got those who are circumcised in the flesh and those who are truly saved who are circumcised in the heart, walking in faith. Matter of fact, Paul writes in Galatians 6, 7, and 9. Let me read this to you. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith, those who have a new heart, those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you, Abraham, so then those who are of faith, those are the ones that are blessed in Abraham, the believer. And so Paul's explaining God's electing, distinguishing grace by saying the true descendants of Abraham who are physically related to him do not belong to the God of Israel unless they have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so we now understand that God's choice is always guaranteed because his word never fails. Uh, we've looked at how uh, God's choice is explained because it's those by faith that have this promise. And next we're going to look at this God's choice illustrated. Look at verse 7b. Look what he says. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Now, stay with me on this. You remember Abraham had two children. You remember that? Ishmael. Ishmael, he was the firstborn. He was a child of Abraham and Hagar, who was Sarah's handmaid. And the Bible tells us that he was of the flesh, not of the spirit. And the secondborn was Isaac. And you remember, Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children initially. Past childbearing years, and God sovereignly works in them, and they have Isaac. So Paul's just again reading his Bible, and he returns to Genesis, and he points out the obvious, that God's people will come through one of Abraham's sons and not the other. God's people are going to come through Isaac. They're not going to come through Ishmael. And it's God's electing, distinguishing grace that's going to determine that for reasons unknown to us, beyond us, his people are going to come through Isaac. It's what God decided. That's God's choice. Now look at verse 8. We continue. That is, 
It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, follow me on this, but the children of the promise are regarded as his descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So Paul is just recounting God's electing, distinguishing grace. And he's bringing our attention. He's bringing our attention to it, that God determined to bring salvation and grace to the nations through Isaac. And that's not enough. He gives us another illustration. Look at, look at verse 10. He says, and not only this... That is Abraham and Sarah, but there was Isaac's wife, Rebekah, also. Now, you remember Rebekah was barren. She was barren also. And, and if you'll skip ahead for a moment, if you'll let me do this, Rachel, um, Jacob's wife, was barren huh. for years till she had Joseph. And so Isaac and Rebekah for 20 years, knowing the promised seed was supposed to be theirs, they're barren. Um, why would God allow these women to be infertile? Three successive generations. You thought about that? God says the promise is going to come through you, and yet they can't have kids. For years and years and years and years. Why would God allow that? After all, He promised. He promised the seed is going to come through you. <laughs> Why cause so much heartache? Why cause so much questioning? Why waiting? Have you thought about that? It's because He wanted them to know. And He wanted us to know that His Electing, distinguishing grace does not come by natural means. He wants it all pointed back to him. He wants to drive the point home. He wants to drive the point home that spiritual birth, just like physical birth, is all of him. We alone cannot bring forth spiritual life. We're, we're helpless. We're helpless in and of ourselves. Everything depends on God. Overcoming our dead, separated hearts caused by sin. You see that. We, that's why we study total depravity. That's why there's this great separation. There is nothing we can bring to the table. And God wants us to get this because He wants all the glory. He doesn't want to share His glory with anybody. Can you imagine how these three women and their husbands felt when they finally became pregnant and they had their son? Can you imagine what they felt like? Think about this. 20 years, years and years and years. Well, I can tell you this. I can tell you this they had a greater appreciation for God's grace. Their pride was smashed, and they loved God more and gave Him more glory. That's the point. That's why God's doing this. And that's the beauty of God's electing, distinguishing grace, ladies, because without God... There is no spiritual life. <laughs> we can't produce ourselves because we too are all barren because of sin. It takes a supernatural work. Now, if we still don't accept what Paul's saying, he continues to make it crystal clear. Stay with me. Look at it. Verse 10b, when she, Rebekah, had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for through the, though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad. Wow. What does that mean? <laughs> it means God's electing, distinguishing grace has nothing to do with us and all with Him. 
Because I want you to think, think for a moment. Think about this. These twin boys, Jacob and Esau, were in the womb together, concurrently, simultaneously, the same womb. They had the same father. They had the same mother. They hadn't performed any works, good or bad. The playing field was exactly level. No child had an advantage over the other one. It was all the same. Verse 11, For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to His choice would stand, not because of His works, but because of Him who calls. So God makes an electing, distinguishing choice, and it was before the boys were born. You see that? God's choice of Jacob had nothing to do with him. God's choice of Jacob had nothing to do with him. It had nothing to do with what he saw or what he would learn or what he would do or what he would not do. It had nothing to do with God looking down a tunnel and learning something. God can't learn anything. He's not God. It had nothing to do with positive traits or negative traits in Jacob or Esau. Nothing. You see this. God's choice was made before either boy had a chance to do something good or bad. Now, that's mind-boggling, but it's right here. God's electing, distinguishing grace is unrelated to what a person might or might not do. That's what we're learning. Look in verse 12. And it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means the custom of the day was that the younger always serve the older. But God always turns things on its head. And He's doing the unexpected. And He, and he again, overturns our social structure and cultural beliefs. <laughs> and He does the unexpected. Why is He doing this again? Because, ladies, he wants us to get in our brains and around the fact that he is the one that decides. He is the one who chooses. We'll never understand it. We'll never, never get close to understanding the mysteries of God's will. What's behind it? It's beyond us. Look, Jacob was not a better guy. In fact, he was worse. He, he, I mean, in some instances, Esau seemed like a better upstanding guy, and Jacob's out there just lying all the time. Can't even trust him. But God chose Jacob and not Esau. And then in verse 13, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, this is a quote in Malachi 1, and there are several uh, ways to take this verse. And you'll be happy to know S. Lewis Johnson and Charles Hodge believe that this word hate means that God loved him less. In Luke, when it says, you must hate your mother and father more, it means that you need to love them less than you do the Lord. That's the way they take this. But then there's others. There's others like Andrew Murray and Sinclair Ferguson that said that's not the case. That Esau was the object of God's displeasure. But here's the point. God set his electing, distinguishing grace on Jacob, and he passed by Esau, leaving him in his sin. Now, I want y'all to get, there's a lot of questions on this. Do you believe in double predestination? Da, 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 da. Here's what we believe. We believe that all men, because of their sin, are separated from God and doomed to hell without God's intervention of salvation and election. Because of the sin that is in us, we were born into sin, we are left in sin, God punishes us. 
Now, there are some thoughts that, that think that, that uh, uh, we don't believe this, that God creates a person to go to hell. But we don't believe that. We believe that men and women go to hell because they are born into sin and they're sinners. And God leaves them in their sin. But this word double predestination is misunderstood. But what that means is, is that Jacob was destined to salvation. And because of Esau's sin, he was destined to hell. Left in his sin, punished in hell. So I want to say this after I wrestle this microphone. If you're here tonight and you love Jesus, it isn't because you're more deserving. The moment we think that God saw something good in us or in Jacob, it's the moment you've discredited God's grace. And you've eliminated it. Because if grace waited for you to respond, it wouldn't be grace. And so Ephesians 2 says, when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, He did what? He made us alive in Christ, for by grace you have been saved. Grace isn't, listen, grace isn't God's love added to your response or your wisdom or added to your aptitude. I told you when I first heard the doctrines of grace, I was so mad and so angry. What do you mean? I didn't have this to do. What do you mean? It did, I didn't have anything to do with this. What do you mean? You know why I was angry? Because I wanted to add something I'd done myself to God's grace. That's why I was angry. And that's why people are angry. If you have faith in Christ and born again, it isn't because God saw something better in you. No, no. It's God's electing, distinguishing grace that comes from the sovereign mind of God that is a million miles away from us understanding. We don't know why He chose to give us grace. And I said earlier, the real question is, why would He choose to elect any? Why would He choose to save any? He should have left us all in our sin. That's the question. Salvation, ladies, is all of grace because we know Jesus didn't die for anything good in us, did he? And so we've seen God's choice is guaranteed, God's choice is explained, God's choice is illustrated, and finally, naturally, Paul expects the question. I mean, this is hard stuff. And many people are hearing this and they're saying, is this fair? Is God really operating in this kind of way? Is this fair and just? And Paul anticipates that. And so look at verse 14. He says, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. So he says, may it never be. It's the strongest language that can be used. No God is not unjust. No God is perfectly just. It's the strongest denial in the Greek. God forbid, He is always just, never unjust. Always. Don't even ask the question. Why is Paul so strong in his answer? I love what Boyce said about this. He says, because it puts us fallen human beings in our proper place. Listen to this, which is the only position from which we can learn about spiritual things. 
The very nature of sin is always wanting to be in God's place. We want to be in God's place. And as long as we are trying to be in God's place, we're never going to be able to hear what he's saying to us. We've got to begin confessing that God is God and that he is therefore right and just in everything he does, even if we don't understand what he's doing. That, that's, that's where we've got to be, ladies. So let me close with this. In our first lesson, we talked about the sovereignty of God. Do you remember that? God's sovereign. Remember, I, we, I started with that on a purpose, on a reason, that, that he has absolute control, and he rules, and he's sovereign over all of creation. He's sovereign, and he rules over all of history. He's sovereign, and he rules all over all of circumstances. And yes, he's sovereign, and he rules over all of salvation. He has the power and the wisdom to do whatever, whatever, and whenever he chooses. He has complete control and oversight to accomplish, and he accomplishes all his good pleasure and purposes. So I want you to turn to Romans 11.36. <clears throat> this is Steve's favorite verse and I think it's one of mine for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever amen for from him he is the source. He is the source of all things. Through him, he is the accomplisher of all things. And to him, he is the end goal of all things. To him be the glory. I used to tell my children, one in particular, that the family didn't revolve around him. And I probably did that because my father told me the same thing. The problems came when someone in the family thought that they were the priority and thought they were more important than the family. And here's what Paul wants us to understand, that the Bible explains this great salvation that the Lord graciously gives, and it doesn't revolve around us. It revolves around God. It's all about Him. And once we get that sorted out in our minds, that salvation begins and ends with Him, then and only then, it becomes about what He did for us on the cross. It's all about Him. We, we get it mixed up. We think it's me, 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 me. It's all about me. No, it starts with God. He, he is the source of all things, the accomplisher of all things, and He is the end goal of all things. To Him be the glory. And so the question is, as you sit here, and I hope you're saved, do you give all the credit to him for your salvation? Think about that. If you give an ounce of credit to anything in you, no matter how small, then your salvation is no longer by grace because you've added something to it. No one in heaven, no one in heaven is going to be walking around saying, I'm here because of what I did. This, this doctrine of election, God's distinguishing grace, is a glorious doctrine. You know why? Because it gives us hope. 
It's our only way to be saved. The only way we can be saved is if God moves on our dead heart. If for some reason, in the counsel of his will, before the foundation of the earth, he's decided to save you, you will be saved. Forever. And it means God accepts you unconditionally. Doesn't, ever ma doesn't matter what you've done or what you will ever do. It's, it's not about anything in me. It's not about anything in you. And so the next question is, how do I know if I'm elect? If I'm, if I'm an elect, if I'm one of the elect, how do I know? I'll tell you how you know. Repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus. Follow him. Make him Lord of your life. Then you'll know you're elect. Admit your inability and his ability and trust in him. So if we understand that, I'm going to say it again, it gives us a greater understanding of what God's grace is, doesn't it? It crushes our pride and it makes us love him more and cherish him more and give him more glory because there but by the grace of God Go, I, and you. All right, let's pray. Father, this is a hard text because it, it fights against the fibers, the sinful, selfish fibers in our being that just want to be a part, that want to bring something, that want to add something, that want to say, we're this, we're that. And Father, we confess that. And Father, I pray you would give us a greater understanding of this, a greater appreciation of what you've done for us. May we not go out here just ignoring this great salvation, the redeeming love in Jesus, that you've dropped the scales off our eyes, that you've brought us to know you. And you'll bring us to heaven for all eternity in complete glorification. And Father, I can't close tonight without saying, Father, that if there are those here that just, just doesn't make sense, that the Bible doesn't make sense, may it start making sense to them right now. Save them. Have them not rest. Have them be anxious and worry until they rest in you. Flee to the cross. Bring everything you have, your sin, to him Cry to him to save you. Make him your Lord. Trust in him and forever be saved. We pray that would happen to someone tonight that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.